Community Research Library Partnership, which underwrites and inspires our work. Uh, attendees from this webinar are from the OCLC RLP, and we want to thank you for your continued support and input into our work, which are crucial to our success. Um, so I am thrilled to welcome uh, our colleagues from Rutgers, uh, but first I want to turn things over to my colleague, Rebecca Bryant from the OCLC Research Library uh, Partnership who can put uh, some of today's presentation in a little more context for you. So take it away, Rebecca. Fairly. Um, I uh, want to welcome you all and also uh, position this webinar as part of a larger series um, that we're offering this fall for the Research Library Partner members on social interoperability and research support. Uh, so this is actually the third webinar we've had on this. Uh, and you can see here we also have several more scheduled uh, that are going to be both case studies like you're hearing today from Rutgers or what we had a couple of weeks ago with the University of Miami. Um, but we're also looking forward to having a couple of spotlights on some of the specific stakeholders that are really valuable for libraries to work with. Uh, and that includes on October 14th, research development professionals, and then later in October, campus communication professionals. And then I hope uh, so, sort of in early January, we'll also be able to have one on um, faculty affairs folks and how they're working with the library. So stay tuned. You can see the link here at the bottom uh, about OCLC and, and the link to the Works in Progress webinars. And so you can follow those and, um, and uh, register for those there. And uh, Marilee, if you can move to the next slide, please. Okay, so really quickly, I am one of the co-authors of this report, along with my colleagues Annette Dortmund and Brian Lavoy. Brian's also on the on the webinar today, uh, and um, you can download the report uh, at the link here. Uh, but the webinar today is a really a companion, one of the several webinar companions to this report on social interoperability and research support cross-campus partnerships and the university research enterprise. Uh, this is uh, designed to uh, demystify in some ways the, the ways that libraries are increasingly need to partner with other stakeholders in order to provide and consume research support. Uh, and it also provides some recommendations for some successful cross-campus relationship building. So we encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, and then the next slide. Very quickly, um, they're actually, these, our speakers, Galen Collier, D. Magnoni, and Susan Oldenburg are going to introduce themselves, but I really want to thank them for joining us today and sharing their expertise. So with that, I think I turn it over to Galen. Hey, thank you very much. So hi, I'm, I'm Galen Collier, and um, as Rebecca mentioned, this is, what we're going to be talking about today is an example of one of those relationship building processes, something uh, wonderful, in my opinion, that we created at Rutgers. And um, we didn't have a lot of plans in the you know, long term to create this position. It was something that happened on relatively short notice. But uh, Dee and I came together and realized that there was a need that um, was, was growing in, in our respective homes in the university. And so we got together and created something that um, luckily for us, uh, enabled us to bring Sue on board. Um, so our first slide is just going to be uh, an image of us and where we are. And um, we'd like to take this opportunity to give a little background on, on who we are and what we do at the university to sort of set the stage for this conversation. Um, I will go ahead and get started with myself. Um, I'm the Director of Research Support in the Office of Advanced Research Computing at Rutgers University. And, and that's a university-wide office that primarily supports research computing activities of all kinds across the university, across our many campuses. So we pretty much cover the entire state. And um, what we do is we, uh, we provide research computing systems and support for those systems for all disciplines uh, across, the, uh, across the university. 
um, whether it's undergraduate students learning to use a research computing system, a, a big cluster for statistical analyses or, or for simulations. If they're just getting started, we provide them with help and we provide them systems to get access to. Um, if it's a grad student who's taking a, taking that path in, in their research training, we will help them with getting software installed, getting their, their computations tuned to perform as, as quickly and efficiently as possible. And for faculty, we provide training and we provide support for their team or for their research projects. We partner on research projects and um, basically support the whole computational side of what we're doing, of what they're doing. Um, and so, so that's a little bit about me. I, I run the uh, support team within our office. Our office is divided among system administrators who are the, the technical folks who get their hands on the machines and do all the cabling and configuration. Um, we have a business operations team within our department that, and their, their focus is primarily dealing with grants and personnel matters. Um, we have a couple of primary leaders of our organization. And then we have my team, which is the researcher facing support team and, and student facing support team. Um, we are a team of seven and we provide support for about, about 2000 users of our systems on a campus that supports approximately 70,000 students to give you an idea of the, the scale. So we're, we're, we're a little bit understaffed for the, the scale of, of community we support but um, we try to keep that under control with lots of documentation and things like that. So that's me. And with that, I will turn it over to either Dee or Sue, whichever of you would like to begin. Thank you, Gail. And I'll go ahead and jump in. This is Dee Magnoni. And um, for those really paying attention, you'll note there is a title difference between the slide that Marilee shared with you and the slide that we began our presentation with. I have gone from um, an associate uh, vice president to the associate university librarian for Rutgers University, New Brunswick. Um, the, the actual scope of my job has not changed, but it strategically aligns me more closely with New Brunswick um, in, in the role as, as far as that goes. Um, the New Brunswick campus is made up of five campuses. Um, College Avenue campus, which is the, the um, old Queens, the original Rutgers campus. Um, Douglas, the traditional women's college. Cook, the original ag school. Um, the Bush campus, largely known for um, environment um, engineering and, and STEM. And then the Livingston campus has the, the business school um, and some other social sciences on it. Um, in on the New Brunswick campus, there are seven library buildings and an annex, a storage facility, uh, four main libraries, three branches, and then um, within Alexander, our, our um, College Avenue uh, main library, there's special collections and university archives. Um, you'll see an image uh, shortly. We are building in the time of COVID our eighth library, which is our virtual library, um, and that that's a bit fun. Quick COVID work story. Um, a short 12 minutes ago, um, my mouse died, and I was on mute, and I couldn't do a thing with my computer. Um, ran down the hall to the <laughs> my spouse's office and grabbed him and he grabbed another mouse and got me up and running before this started. So fun, fun work life in the, the age of COVID. <laughs> With that, I will turn it over to Sue. Uh, thank you, Dee. Um, so I am Sue Oldenburg and I am the, well, fairly new, um, I think I'm hitting the six month mark right now, um, research support and GIS specialist. Um, and I have a foot in both um, the Office of Advanced Research Computing under Galen, and um, uh, my other foot is in the New Brunswick Libraries under D. And I am um, here as that collaboration that we're about to talk about, uh, the, the physical representation of that collaboration. Um, sitting in both spaces, but serving that um, community of 2,000 to 70,000, really, um, when I think about it like that. Um, yes, and I, I think that I, I will end 
that with that. I will end myself with that and we can move on. <laughs> All right, so this is Galen again. Um, I'm going to start by talking in, in some depth about what my office does, what my side of this partnership is typically responsible for. This is, this is a summary of, of kind of what my office um, is all about. So we're the Office of Advanced Research Computing. Um, we're a fairly typical compute-focused research computing support team. A lot of the larger universities have these in place. Um, and, and even some small universities have these in place, but we typically huddle around a, a single centralized compute system, a big research computing cluster, and um, we give access to, to various people based on different criteria. At Rutgers, um, Rutgers is, is a little bit unique in that we allow all students, staff, and faculty to access the system for free. And what that does is it creates a fairly large population of users, but it's not, it's, it's a very diverse population of users. Um, and and in, in a system where you would typically have people getting access based on grant money or something like that, you would have a narrower scope of users and they would typically be advanced users. We have the full range from people who, who can barely handle computing of any kind to people who are very experienced users and they're all sharing this big instrument and, and that requires a good bit of support and coordination and training. Um, the, uh, the primary emphasis of our work is typically the machine itself, the computing part itself. We do delve into some of the more advanced aspects like um, actual applications and, and, and helping researchers with um, non-compute aspects of their research, but our, our primary focus is the computing itself. So the expertise that we have that extends out to the more advanced applications is fairly limited. Um, however, over the past few years, we've found that we've had a, we have a, a rapidly growing focus on data-centric computing and in particular informatics. Um, that, that little list you see there on the slide it highlights some of the examples of data-centric or informatics-centric computing that we host on our systems. And it's, it's often the case where we'll have a researcher come to us and they need support, they need the access to the computing system, and that's pretty straightforward, we can provide that. But sometimes they will need something a little bit more. They will need advice. They will need advice on how to proceed with their research, how to manage their data, um, best practices for doing various things, not just working with the compute instrument. And, and, and that's becoming more common than it was in the past. Um, and finding a way to address those needs and to, to provide that additional help is, is, always, a, is always a challenge for us. Um, an important part of uh, what we do as well, in addition to providing the instrument and access to the instrument, we do a lot of partnership on, on grant opportunities. We partner with researchers in a variety of different forms. We can provide dedicated compute resources, or we can provide a portion of our team members' time. If somebody wants to really be embedded in a research group and provide, say, 10 or 25 percent of their time to a particular project for a year or something, that's not uncommon. We engage with researchers in that way, too. So that kind of illustrates how we operate generally. Um, the next slide is a, a, a sort of a visual representation of the, the areas of focus that we are, we are typically dealing with. My office most commonly, um, I'm gonna work with some of the uh, annotation tools here. Let's see how this goes. So my office typically will um, deal with this portion of the, uh, of the stack. We're hosting the hardware system itself and we will provide access to and teach people how to use the system's software or, or basically the interface to that hardware. In other words, we'll show people how to use the cluster, how to submit jobs, um, how to move their data in and things like that. And when you get to those higher levels of the stack where we have data access, that, that big chunk of data access, analysis, integration and management, and a lot of the applications like um, 
you know, Python scripting, R scripting, using ArcGIS, or even using, uh, making use of some of the features that the, the, the library brings expertise with, those are some of the things that our team will, it's kind of a gray area, our team will bump up into that area sometimes, but it's really not our wheelhouse. That's not the area where we can typically provide expertise. And we really want to because we have researchers coming to us saying, hey, I need help not only with the compute instrument, but I also need help with doing this analysis. What's the best way to do this? Or do you have any capabilities beyond just the compute? Can you help me with this epidemiological study? Do you know anything about um, best practices for data management or how to use metadata? And, and so that's, that's an, an area of need. And um, as it says at the bottom of the slide there, what's missing? So GIS is a very, very big example of uh, an additional layer of capability that we, by default, are not able to provide. And those data management best practices are also something that we, it, it's that gray area that we're not able to address directly. All right. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Dee to give an overview of the world that she comes from at the university. Thank you, Galen. Um, so I, I've put a few images here to, um, to be able to talk about where we've come and where we are now um, in, in New Brunswick libraries. And when um, you, you look at the map on the left, that, that is an illustration of New Brunswick. So you can see the five campuses, starting with Bush, Livingston, the smallest real estate, um, College Avenue, and then Cook and Douglas there on, on the other side. And so while I say we have five campuses, um, it is one campus and it is part of um, Rutgers University and so Galen just talked about how his office supports all of Rutgers. I support New Brunswick. We also have the newer campus Camden RBHS which is our health sciences um, and then over those campuses we have our central infrastructure and our central central infrastructure um, does things like our, our collections and our cataloging and our servers, um, all of these things that benefit all of us. So there's essentially four local units and a central unit making up the libraries at Rutgers. Um, in New Brunswick, we have approximately half of everything, half, half the number of students in the entire university, half the, the faculty and, and the, the budget. I think we're 51% um, technically. Um, and and um, so that's that's how we operate. Um, COVID happened, and um, and so here we are um, operating re remotely for quite some time. And now we're tiptoe tiptoeing back to some in person some services. Um, you know, curbside pickup, which we call click and collect. And so you can see um, on the, the, the bottom there, some of our staff, they are back in the libraries. We have A and B weeks. So um, um, half of our access services staff are in on the A weeks and half are in on the, the B weeks. And they're doing scanning for reserves and that click and collect, they're, they're pulling collections and doing that curbside pickup, um, getting ready for, for students. We do now have some students in the building. Um, the, the staff who are operating aren't working um, actively with those students. We have security guards at the, at the doors that check IDs and then more security guard, another security guard that um, walks the space and makes sure we stay within the capacity of the space um, and our um, computer labs are also in the libraries, and so it's the computer labs and study spaces together. That image up at the top um, looks like a slightly warped picture. This is actually, um, we went into our Douglas library with 360 degree cameras, and we have created images of um, each of the spaces within Douglas. And we are creating our, our eighth library, our virtual library, where we will be having um, exhibits and talks and tours. Um, and uh, 
we we didn't want the eighth library to look like Douglas, so we stylized it, which is which is why it looks um, the way it, it does as far as the coloring. And um, it's it's a really interesting project. We're working on that with our grid, um, our, our gaming research um, computer people. But uh, that that is an evolving project and and something that's happened with COVID. And you'll see my Bitmoji down there. That's that's me asking if you need help, if you have any questions. So that just talks a little bit about us working in, in the age of COVID. Um, and so with the arc of our services, we did strategic planning a year ago. And our core mission, um, our, our core goals are what most core library goals would be. We want to empower student success. We want to strengthen faculty and graduate student research and teaching, and we want to build connections. And these building connections is really um, what today's presentation is about. We can no longer do anything on our, our own, or we can, well, we can't do most things on our own. And um, one of the needs that was coming out of our um, subject expertise and our connections with the schools and the departments was GIS. Um, there were a number of schools who needed that capability of support from us, and we didn't have it. Um, we also in we also did not have a, a full budget to support it, and so this was one of the areas where I needed a partnership. I, I it was something I could not do on our own. Um, looking at the arc of our services and, and who we work with, we, we do a lot of training within New Brunswick Libraries and a lot of research training. And we, we discovered, turning to OARC, that a lot of the training we do in the libraries, they do in OARC at a different level. We do a lot of starting, you know, getting started with Python kind of thing, um, and, and they would be further along that scale. And we did have overlap. And so starting these conversations and talking with Galen, we, we, really, um, we really recognized this um, GIS overlap that we, we both needed. And I think that's where move us a little bit forward. So Galen, I think you take the- yeah, yeah. I can jump in here. Um, you know, there were, as Dee mentioned, there were some, there were some, um, uh, opportunities for partnership between our, our our respective homes at the university, if you will. Um, some things were already in place. For example, that that um, overlap of, of training, for example, with the Python programming or with our programming, things like that. Um, we discovered that we did have a little bit of overlap there. And from the perspective of my office, we saw that as an opportunity to scale back and focus more heavily on our our true area of expertise, you know, getting closer to the compute instrument itself, and instead have the library be the designated party responsible for researchers, you know, for students, staff, and faculty to get that kind of training. Because in, in many ways, the libraries um, had already had already established a really adept team for providing. Um, that level of training, and we were doing it on a part-time basis, and we weren't even necessarily comfortable doing it. We would run a Python workshop if we kind of had to, um, if there was a lot of demand for it, but it was really ad hoc, and the library had a much more mature program for handling that, so it seemed like a natural fit to agree with the libraries, hey, you guys handle all of that part of it, and we will handle everything that, that gives people access to the instrument and so on. We'll have handle everything leading up to that. And um, specifically with, with GIS, we had heard um, we had heard instances of demand for that. We, um, as I mentioned earlier, we had a lot of um, agricultural studies. We had epidemiological studies. There's a lot of medical informatics getting a lot of attention now. And there was an easy, uh, pretty easy demand for a layer of insight of, you know, when it comes to GIS over a lot of those projects. And that was something that we did not, we simply didn't have the capability to provide. And there were, um, 
there were instances of GIS support around the university, but we didn't want to take the researchers that we were working very closely with and, and basically hand them off to someone else. We really wanted to have some um, representation for GIS within our organization and at the same time grow that relationship that we had, we had established with the library. And um, we came to realize that the way to do that, rather than having um, shared training or something, and rather than directing researchers back and forth between the two, a great way to do that would be to create a position, create um, all the things we need in a person that can represent both the libraries and the Office of Advanced Research Computing. Um, in, in previous attempts to get something like this going, we found that temporary programs, a scheduled series of, of events or something like that, simply wasn't getting the job done because you weren't building a community and you didn't have anything to anchor that community around. A person, a leader, could be the anchor for a community like that. And so we found that a program simply wouldn't achieve what, what a person could. And what we needed in a person was somebody that obviously could represent the libraries and our resources, but also somebody who could serve as a, a point of contact, a subject matter expert for GIS. And that person really needed to be an effective communicator. That, that needed to be somebody who was passionate about GIS, passionate about learning, who could go out there and take the initiative to carve out new territory and explore and build programs that could benefit both the Office of Advanced Com Research Computing and, and um, the libraries. When we started the process of, of developing that position, um, we, we had a few obstacles, as you might guess, at any, uh, in any university setting. We had pretty strict HR policies that were kind of an obstacle. It's not like you can really uh, put together an idea for a position and have HR agree, hey, that's a great idea, let's do it. That's really not how it worked. Uh, we, we really had to struggle to get HR to agree with us. Um, the position design, this was something entirely new. We didn't really have a map for how to proceed. And um, it was something that we were going to have to create from scratch. And so there had to be a lot of agreement when we first began this conversation. There was a lot of careful agreement, careful about what we're committing to, careful about what we're giving up, perhaps, between our office and the libraries. And funding was an obstacle. Um, again, this, this discussion was happening, happening pre-COVID. Um, we, we've been hit with a lot of funding restrictions since COVID took over the, the, the landscape. But even before that, we didn't have the funding to cover a full position. So that's part of the reason why this didn't really come up earlier is because it was it was sort of an aspirational idea, but not something we could really take action on because we, we really kind of couldn't afford to. Um, and when we got into the conversation with the libraries, we found, and, 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 and you know, Dee, I'll have, to I'll have to rely on you to agree with me on this, you know, the libraries also didn't have the funding to create a, a whole position like that from scratch. So the idea, <laughs> and the idea of working um, with HR and the libraries to say, hey, we want to create this position, and it's going to be split between our two organizations. You know, is this doable? How's it going to work? Where's the funding going to come from? You know, what is what is the multi-year trajectory for this position? And um, in that discussion, we found that funding and sharing it between the library and ourselves created an opportunity that didn't exist before. You know, having that conversation created an opportunity that we didn't know existed. We could split this person, and this person could contribute to the libraries and contribute to our office in the in in the scope that we need because you know we we don't necessarily need to have somebody 100 percent full-time right off the bat we could use part-time help for some time and then transition into a more permanent um, version of that program so the funding was sort of a, a, a synergistic opportunity in a way that that gave us a chance to to create something that didn't exist before and um, Dee, did you want to did you want to chime in on anything that that I've I've just been rambling on? Did you want to chime in on any of the stuff that we have on this slide? 
No, you you covered it really well. Except the um, we we've emphasized um, you, Gail, and OARC are a university office, and I am a New Brunswick unit. And that I would um, and that is in that position design within the obstacles. Um, HR and and each of our units really um, struggled with that a little bit with how it would work with how the the service. Um, arrangements would work and and that was that was a good bit of the the conversation in crafting and designing this and i am i am guessing in in uh rutgers across the university that we are fairly unique in the design of this position um uh, hopefully a great test case of success for um, future positions yes absolutely Oh, and I, I am, yep. <laughs> okay, that brings us to our first question. So, uh, how, how do you really want to handle this? Yeah, I think, uh, Marilee, were you going to handle the, the Yeah, question? yeah, sure. So, mm -hmm. this is uh, kind of an interactive portion for our audience, so I want to um, invite you to go to the URL that I just posted in to chat which is uh, pollev.com slash OCLC. And our question for you is what shared positions exist within your unit at your institution? So we're just curious to hear from those uh, who are, um, who are uh, participating today. Um, uh, what, let's see, and I'm gonna take back uh, presenter privileges here for just a moment and um, share uh my screen and let's just see if we can get um uh some some interaction with the with folks so uh once again if you go to um pollev.com slash oclc uh you'll be able to participate in this poll we'll give folks just a couple of moments here to go ahead and type things in um i'm not seeing anything just now uh, D, are there other examples of shared positions that um, that you have or or would aspire to have um, while we're waiting for uh, uh, for um, or have you uh, maybe maybe I'm foreshadowing things that are to come in the presentation, but uh, what what other types of positions would you? Like right. to have. Now, we, we have one other um, that is a more traditional share, perhaps, and that is uh, we, we have a librarian who is half um, within New Brunswick Libraries and then half within the School of Communications and Information, and she teaches some, um, you know, library and communications related courses there and so i think that's one that that people may have seen um over time and that that that's been in place for many years um, this is a position that that's quite new and different and challenged our hr folks um aspire to have my goodness that that would be fun <laughs> to throw out to the audience um because i think there are so many possibilities um here. Okay, so we're getting a couple, but but a bunch of like, I would like to have one, um, don't have one yet. I'm going to leave this poll open for a bit and we can come back to it um, and look at it later. But in the interest of time, I think we'll uh, go ahead and um, and uh, and move along. We'll be uh, just for our participants, we'll be doing another poll at that same URL. Uh, so, uh, so keep that handy. And if you do have things to add to the current poll, please do that. That poll is still active and we can come back to that later. So why don't you go ahead and continue, Dee? Thanks. Terrific. Thanks so much. And so we, we brought you up to the point where we created the position. Um, and so um, um, sausage making, we hired Sue. <laughs> and so we, we got to here. The position is created. So what does it look like? And what does it do? And um, Galen, once again, over to you. Sure. Um, there were there were a few reasons why we um, so we we created the position as a part of 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 my office's 
team. Um, so basically, Sue was hired into the Office of Advanced Research Computing, and um, in, in, in exchange for uh, funding input from the New Brunswick Libraries, we basically al allow her to take half of her time and spend that time in support of the New Brunswick Libraries. But she is a, an she is most basically an employee of our office. Um, and her, her title designation, um, you know, every university has their own unique title system, but there may be some similarities. Um, within Rutgers, she's a research specialist, and the majority of our research support team are research scientists, uh, people who've been doing research computing support for a decade or so, people with PhDs in particular disciplines, that sort of thing. And, and so we've, we've sort of plugged her in among that team with that title. Um, and uh, Dee, did you want to comment a second or two on the on the title that she has within the library? Oh, she actually um, also has research specialist um, title. It's the um, <laughs> am I right, Sue? <laughs> yeah, I think research yes, specialist. The same title. <laughs> uh, yeah, the same title for both. Yes. Yeah, so I changed the functional simply as a descriptor uh, with the library piece of this. It's funny, our, we've, we have the same sort of issue in, in, our, in our office. We have um, the name that HR ascribes to these positions is not necessarily the name that we actually use or that we put on business cards or in our signatures because sometimes the, the, the position name that we get from HR just doesn't do a good job of kind of encapsulating what this person's role is. So that it's not uncommon at Rutgers. Um, so why, why, what are some of the reasons why we base the position in my office? Um, one is that we're a university-wide office, and that created a, an opportunity for Sue to spend half of her time in support of initiatives spanning the entire university instead of being focused on a particular campus. Um, we have a, a pretty experienced business operations team and that turned out to be really useful in the position creation process. And it's also really useful for us in the, in the process of getting Sue plugged into um, providing support on grants. Um, having that experienced, focused business operations team was kind of an advantage. Um, our office has sort of a hybrid centralized and, and local um, footprint. And what I mean by that is we have components of our infrastructure. We have systems on the various campuses throughout the university. We have systems in Camden down south, and we have systems in Newark up north, and we have systems in New Brunswick and Piscataway in the middle. Um, and so we, so we kind of have that footprint all over the place. We have representation specifically in Newark, specifically in Camden, but our, uni our system, our services are provided um, in, in a centralized fashion. Everybody from every campus connects to us and to our systems basically through the same interface, the same portal. Um, and one other aspect of bringing Sue on board um, with, with uh, sort of anchored in, in our office was that to provide, to provide sort of uh, regular research computing support in our office, there, were, there would be quite a lot of onboarding. The onboarding process in our office is pretty long because there's quite a lot we expect users, or we expect um, our, our uh, team members to be able to, to do when it comes to helping users independently. And so we wanted Sue to have the opportunity to be plugged into all kinds of training opportunities that are typically going on in our office. And, and so that was, that was yet another reason um, why, we, uh, why we ended up making the position based primarily within our office. Um, and so within the, uh, okay, and I was just going to parallel over on the library side, um, Sue does have this subject matter expertise on, um, amongst our librarians, and, and many of our librarians have subject matter expertise with their librarianship. And so within the library, Sue attends our faculty meetings. Um, she has a lot of synergies with our digital humanities functions and our data functions. And, and so there's actually a team where um, they, they coexist. And um, she's served a lot on our, our scholarship and our celebration of scholarship team and um, has created 
beautiful maps for us as well, of course. So the, the function is not only is she teaching out to the community, um, she, she's also um, supplying um, some, some product that has been incredibly useful for us. And, and down at the bottom of that slide, we mentioned the split. That split is actually 50-50. It's completely half in LARC and half in the libraries. And, and that creates for some, that creates for, you know, some significant time management responsibilities on Sue's part. We originally planned for there to be a formal schedule or specific days were dedicated in some way, but we found that just, just letting that arrangement be completely fluid and up to Sue seemed to work a lot better. Well, and I'll chime in to say um, COVID caused more fluidity than probably would ever have been expected in that um, originally uh, when first interviewed and, and moved around campus and meeting people in that, uh, it's, and have uh, physically, I'm supposed to have two spaces, one at, um, with the rest of the uh, OR team on the Bush campus and an office in the main library, Alex on the College Avenue campus. Um, but since there is no physical space, there's no way for me to be seen as being in one place or another. So fluidity being remote has just um, happened organically. Um, therefore, uh, I'm, I feel uh, right now that um, I definitely am 50-50 in both um, environments, but one minute might be focused on a research computing question and the next moment might be focused on um, something through the libraries and which um, creates interesting challenges and, um, and uh, opportunities um, for keeping balance uh, for one thing. So this is me on this slide, um, obviously uh, working remotely at home. Um, uh, doing some GIS, but at the same time on my screens in this image, you can, I have um, OARC information up, I have a LibGuide up, I'm responding, at, at this moment I was looking at a, uh, um, or working with a map for a workshop um, and responding to questions that had happened, come out of a workshop that I was about to send off to uh, an attendee. And um, so it's, um, the physical and the remote balance, um, at first with uh, COVID initially, um, I thought would be really challenging. And what happened was it just freed me up to provide service to whoever needed service, especially for the GIS side of it. Um, in terms of actually providing service to internally to my the team at Research Computing and the team of uh, library colleagues. Um, it's interesting that balance, there is no strict, um, you know, this hour I'm here, this hour I'm here. It, it, it shows up on my calendar, which I give everybody access to. And um, the support that I'm providing this non-GIS, that is as being a, a teammate and a colleague, um, the structures of research computing and the libraries really are run side, side by side, hand in hand. So internal support, it's the same kind of thing. Even external support to our community users, it's the same, um, the essential parts of that is the same. Now the, the um, time structure might be a little bit different. So uh, for example, in research computing, there is a, a for all the library folks here, um, there's a point of contact role that every team member plays on um, in Galen's team or in the team that I'm on with Galen. And that is being basically um, chat reference or chat research assistant. Um, it's online contact. Uh, uh, researchers are contacting research computing looking for assistance and, um, and we provide it over uh, online electronically. It's the same, and I am um, joining the chat research assistance group at the library. It's basically the same thing, except the shifts are different. So point of contact research computing is a week long endeavor where uh, the research assistants, chat research assistants are shifts throughout the week, repeated across time as is normal. Um, 
One of the challenges with this balance is prioritizing and uh, uh, how I default to that um, between the two um, units is uh, I default to the researcher first. If there is if there's a researcher that I'm there um, assisting in any way, they if if I'm, my time is getting um, requested from either side, I'm still focused on the research because I believe that's ultimately the goal is to serve and facilitate and support, um, especially in the GIS, uh, the GIS expertise, all the researchers that are coming coming to me. Um, the the next part of this was um, Galen referred to it the onboarding bit, the high learning curve with uh, um, uh, being in OARC for me. Um, I have a background in libraries and GIS. So my previous uh, experience, I had been in an academic library, university library, and um, had um, had been there for a while, and also as a GIS specialist there, um, where all the GIS support sat in the library. There was no other space. Um, we uh, we did. Um, uh, collaborate with research computing at that institution ever so often and that was very specifically for training uh, workshop kinds of things but nothing as um, nothing as uh, intense and as focused as this collaboration um, <clears throat> pardon me um, so the high learning curve was is a challenge but also an opportunity so um, being an OARC with that onboarding um, and the intensity of uh, um, learning a new language, learning all the parts of the language of research computing, um, I, it's a, for me, it was a good place to be. It was slightly less intense having a library's background to slide into the library and then meeting people, understanding subject specialties, have being, being given uh, introductions and all of that kind of thing that happens to the library to spread the news about GIS, um, which, Arguably, is easier through the libraries right now, but um, we'll will eventually uh, be going in all directions. Let's see. Um, the last challenge and opportunity is uh, um, things that all been, uh, Galen and Dee have already referred to: central versus local. It's been that's been interesting. Um, as I came from an institution that was centralized, and therefore um, direct access to everybody in the institution was. Uh, accepted um, activity. And here there are a few more steps from the, if you're starting from the local level to get to folks, um, but making connections still happens. Um, and that that's one of the, um, the pieces of this that uh, I think that I, the position being central and local um, really it, uh, helps make connections. So, um, there are, I know we're running tight on time, so I, I, I have plenty of examples of making connections. Um, the, uh, almost immediately, somebody came to research computing and had a GIS question. It, it, it started with database storage, but that person was referred to me, and then I had a uh, consultation with them and realized that the thing that they were doing, they were in uh, political science and they were looking at scraping Twitter data, um, fed right into a digital humanities um, space. And so I connected the digital humanist with librarian with that person and that um, created a great connection and support for that researcher. And in the opposite way, um, I, through the digital hum, human, humanist librarian, I met a, um, a public policy graduate student who was struggling with the data sets um, and uh, her computer was crashing all the time uh, because the data was so large. So that was a um, place for me to then connect her to the um, uh, opportunities and the resources of the uh, re advanced research computing. Um, those are just a few examples of how I see the that this position is a connecting position and uh, the um, and actually everything about it is quite has been quite enjoyable on my part um, as the person in there. I've enjoyed the back and forth. I enjoyed the learning. Um, the workshops uh, I enjoyed. I, I'm just going to say 
it's been a really good experience for me personally, and I um, and I think it's paying off at the at the university for the university community, the researchers that I've come in contact with. Um, I know we're right on time here, so I'm going to um, move us into this slide real quick because we have a few more things to comment on. Um, yeah. Uh, so, um, Galen, did you want to speak to um, these parts or D? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> well, I can do it. I, but <laughs> some of the, some of the great things that have that have happened since we brought Sue on board, some opportunities we were taking it be able that we were able to take advantage of that we weren't really able to to address before. Um, there since COVID changed everything for us, there has been a significant uptick in demand for introductory level training and, and familiarization with our systems. Sue, having just been brought on board, was going through that process herself. So it was fresh in her mind. So she was very well primed for having those conversations and providing guidance to students, staff, and, and, and um, faculty in getting on our systems for the first time. Um, of course, that, that GIS and data stewardship expertise that has been brought to the table and allows, allows us to now have the conversations when it comes to partnerships, we can say, yes, we have that expertise and we can bring that to the table if you want to engage with us, whether that's inside the university or with other universities across the country. Um, the uh, software carpentry training is something that we wanted to bring on board, but we were really just focusing on a portion of software carpentry. Now with Sue as an integral part of our team, we can cover the whole range of software carpentry titles, including library carpentry. And, and that initiative can grow much more fully than it would before than it would have been able to before Sue came on board. Um, and then Sue's also been able to take the lead on the on an effort to centralize software access and licensing for our ArcGIS software licenses. So, you know, again, making another um, significant step in the way of GIS on our, you know, on our campuses. So that, that, that's, you know, just a few of the things that we can add. There's actually quite a lot more, but we just don't have the time. And I agree. I'll be um, quite quite quick. Um, both with Sue and then the the arc of the library's OARC relationship in in general has led us to a couple of grant opportunities that we would have never pursued before. Um, Sue, along with our digital humanities person, is participating in an Institute of Women's Leadership grant grant writing, and then between the offices, between OARC and libraries, and with our Special Collections University Archives, we went after an NEH grant that brings together technology, um, primary resources, research methods, and an international partner. And this, this um, I, I, I guess I will pause there. Um, it was really exciting writing this grant. And the coordinated training, um, Sue is now in this um, Libraries to OARC um, band of training, and it's really to the benefit of our students and our faculty. Oh, and Sue, you did your part. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, I muted myself. Um, uh, I'll speak to the COVID-19 peculiarities about the uh, coordinated training. Um, that, interestingly enough, uh, that central versus local thing has um, the benefits of COVID in this situation is that previously that coordinated training out of New Brunswick libraries would have reached um, our New Brunswick Library campus uh, uh, attendance and audience. Um, so, as Dee noted before, about 51% of the population. Um, and with um, the training now in COVID times, it, it's available to the entire campus. Uh, so, workshops that I've been hosting have been full and have had um, folks coming from Newark, Camden, RBHS, as well as um, the uh, New Brunswick area, which a benefit to COVID is that online, the, we can all talk about the, uh, the struggles with that, but really and truly the services being extended has been pretty wonderful. And that connects all, all these folks to the libraries and to OARC, which I think is a great benefit. Um, all right, Oops. because of time, we had this 
next polling question. Um, don't know that uh, if anybody would like to answer this, Marilee, or shall we just move on to just questions because we've run it into the end of the hour? Um, I can go ahead. So I have that poll open at the, and I'll put that into chat and we can see if um, people uh, have a response to that. We can leave that poll open. Um, but I suggest uh, in the interest of time that we that we go to any questions. I know that we had a couple of things um, in chat. I don't know, Rebecca, if you want to walk through those and also give people um, a moment to uh, to uh, put any of their own questions in. Yeah, we've had some uh, questions in chat, uh, mostly from Marilee and myself, and, and actually it's been lovely uh, that Dee has answered some of these um, about uh, tips for onboarding people. So for one of these, um, you know, we ask what are tips do you have for, for people coming into shared positions who don't have a library background? And Dee responded that um, while onboarding can be fairly, fairly personal, um, if somebody doesn't have a library background, she'd make sure that there was a mentor or coach and also invite that person to familiarize them uh, with the community and have them join, you know, ALA, et cetera. Um, I also asked if this position helped researchers, you know, find, uh, because it's a joint position, if it would help researchers find them. And, and actually it was also something that, um, Sue, Sue commented on is that, you know, because she's doing the virtual workshops, it seems like they're more full. Uh, and um, people who, who may go to OARC but actually need library help are more likely to get to the library now. So that's sort of one of the benefits also that Dee put in the chat. Um, and if anybody else has questions, I know we only have about a minute left. Um, Marilyn, you want to comment on the poll? I, I'm not seeing any responses from the poll just yet. Um, uh, I did have a comment, however, um, Sue remarked on the unexpected benefits of COVID being kind of that uh, broader virtual participation. And um, uh, Rebecca, I think that that's something that you and Brian have heard in other conversations that you've facilitated is that uh, moving to uh, virtual training options has really afforded broader participation um, than than we've seen previously, and I think has been something that people have wanted to do, uh, but but haven't, and now have to. Um, so I thought that was an interesting thing to pull out from the um, from what you noted. Yeah, I think we also heard this earlier this year in another webinar that that Rutgers gave about their graduate. Um, uh, the specialist, thank you, Dee, uh, program is that actually a lot of your training and workshops, and this is probably true for other of you attending, is that um, you, you're seeing a boost in, in graduate uh, students who may be attending workshops also because they're virtual. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, there are silver linings, so um, great to hear. And also, um, I just mentioned that webinar. A recording is available for those of you who are, are interested in, the, in another exciting program from Rutgers. Yes. Um, so I'm not seeing any questions. Um, I want to thank you guys all for your uh, for your participation. Especially thank our uh, expert group from Rutgers for so freely sharing so much um, information and wisdom with us today. Uh, as previously noted, this webinar has been recorded. We will be sharing the recording of the webinar along with uh, slides, um, links, other other things, uh, a link to the previous webinar from uh, Rutgers, which uh, Rebecca noted. And so I just want to um, take a moment and thank you all for your participation. And this concludes today's webinar. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.